scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 9 through 13, on page 61 of the Pew Bible. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to a test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Thank you. 
that blesses our souls. I met Kenan as he would sing at Greater Bethesda during the Born to Die cantata, and he sang that song and I recorded it and it became my morning devotion. Um, and, and then I think I changed cell phones and I lost the video. And so, before you leave today, I, I need my morning devotion back. Amen. Good morning, Hyde Park Union. It's good to be here on today. Just need a little space. Our scripture this morning is Luke 4, verses 9. I want to say she read Luke 13. I have, it's okay, I have a little more scripture to read. Uh, I'll read verses 13 through 22 and then 28. Jesus went to Nazareth, excuse me. Jesus, after finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised on the Sabbath. He went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's faith. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, to them, excuse me, today this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Everyone was raving about Jesus. So impressed were they by the gracious words flowing from his lips. They said, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? And then Jesus continues to preach, and we'll talk a little bit about that during the sermon. But by the time you get to verse 28, the very people who were impressed by his gracious words. Then the scripture says, when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with anger. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The message today is the ongoing revolution of Jesus. And I've added my subtitle, lead, follow, or get out of the way. <laughs> For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Thomas Paine, one of the founding fathers of this nation, known as a revolutionary, receives credit for first saying, we follow or get out of the way. But I first heard these words from my former boss, for over 12 years, I worked at a project management and engineering firm that was trying to revolutionize the way capital projects were done in corporate America. The president of the company, his name is Rich Panico, was sure that if people equipped with leadership and project management skills would understand and buy into his mission, develop a plan, execute a plan, and properly manage resources, any project could be completed on time and on budget, a rarity in corporate America. Richard Rich, my former boss, was in an airport one day, saw these placards that said, leave, follow, or get out of the way, and bought one for every person in the company. <laughs> no matter whose cubicle you went into, you always saw these words, leave, follow, or get out of the way. And I know the saying seems harsh, but it really was both challenging and liberating. You see, we didn't have to wonder what Rich Panico expected of us. Rich oozed leadership, and every day he felt from his presence the expectation that all of his employees be leaders. It was as if he was a walking billboard saying, our mission is clear, and if we're going to 
live out our mission and accomplish what I have envisioned for this company, for all of corporate America, and for you as my employees, I implore you, I encourage you, I need you to either lead, follow, or get out of the way. And like my former boss's mission was clear, my current boss, his name is Jesus, his mission is also crystal clear. It's found in Luke 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Should sound familiar? Pastor Sarah preached from this last week, and the lectionary text just continues to go in this vein and continues on in Luke 4, which is where we're headed. This was and still is the mission of a revolution. And there are debates about whether Jesus was being literal or spiritual. But I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus was being literal. You can add spiritual if you want to, but when Jesus said the poor, he wasn't talking about the spiritually poor. He was talking about the economically poor, the marginalized. Jesus was beginning a revolution that would turn society on its head and end literal poverty, oppression, incarceration, and debt. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus wasn't talking about spiritual, but the spirit was on him. And he was starting a revolution that would drastically improve people's lives. And those of us who claim to be followers of Christ need to understand this revolutionary mission. And once we understand it, we need to make a decision to either lead, follow, or get out of the way. Why so harsh a phrase? I'm glad you asked. Because people are suffering and dying from literal poverty, literal oppression, literal incarceration, literal debt, and are sick and tired of being sick and tired to quit, to quote Fannie Lou Hamer. And part of the reason which they're suffering is that there are people who call themselves Christians and institutions, they call themselves churches, who know nothing about Christ or his revolution. Those who claim Christianity but don't know a thing about and would even disagree with Jesus' mission are simply making life difficult for people across the world as injustice and oppression comes from their hands, actions, inactions, and indecision. And my challenge to them and to all of us is to make sure that we know Jesus. Amen? Amen. Understand his revolutionary mission. Why else would he come unless it was going to be revolutionary? Make sure that is crystal clear. And if you still decide to continue on this Christian journey, I implore you, I encourage you, I need you to lead, follow, or get out of the way. Now, how am I sure that Jesus was starting a revolution? I'm glad you asked that too. It's simple. Because Jesus, right before he started the revolution, the devil tried to take it's right there in verse 9. The devil brought him into Jerusalem, stood him on the highest point of the temple, and said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. That sounds like an invitation to commit suicide. Each of the three temptations which we find at the beginning of Luke were designed to end Jesus' ministry. But the last one was designed to end Jesus' life. The devil tried to take Jesus out. Jump, he said, because he knew Jesus was starting a revolution. This Black History Month, we could call the role of those who were starting a revolution and their lives were snuffed out. Martin, Malcolm, Medgar, Fred, and others. And the devil is still trying to take out those who stand for justice and equality, even those like Sandra Bland who simply stand up for themselves. But so many of us are still standing and God is on our side. And since we're still standing, we should not just stand here, we should lead, follow, or 
get out of the way. And as you keep standing, please know that the devil won't stop you. You see, the devil wasn't done with Jesus. The devil won't stop, I mean. He wasn't done with Jesus. He wanted to stop this revolution. Verse 13 says that the devil left Jesus until the next opportunity. Well, the next opportunity came pretty quickly. It was in verse 14. It says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside, and he taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Did you catch it? That's okay if you missed it. It's coming back again. Get the picture. Jesus reads his revolutionary mission statement. He speaks out about proclaiming good news to the poor, frisbee for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, set the oppressed and the debtors free, the debtors free, and the devil determined to put an end to this revolution came right at him. Verse 22 says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Everyone praised him. All spoke well of him. If there's anything that is deadly to a revolution, it's being seduced by the praise of people. But it was the praise of people that told Jesus that the people didn't get it. Jesus wasn't satisfied with the praise of people because he's on assignment from God. And he's leading a revolution. Say a revolution. A revolution. And with his mission in mind, Jesus just leaned in and kept on preaching. Listen to verse 25. Jesus says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any one of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Jesus is preaching from 1 Kings 17, 7 through 16. So get the picture. There's a severe drought, no rain, three and a half years. Everyone is affected by the famine. There are widows. Some were Israelites, God's chosen people. But Jesus highlights for them that from, from their own sacred text, he's reading the Old Testament, which they have. And he says, from your own sacred text, it shows that God, Bless a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon, a non-Israelite, lower-class, single-mother widow, amidst a community that worships Baal. In other words, in the wild, rough part of town, from the hood, if you will. God blesses her instead of one of their ancestors, widows among the children of Israel. God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, actually blesses not one of the chosen people, but someone they considered worthless, the marginalized, the lower class, single mother without a man in the hood. Jesus taught them that Sidonian widows' lives matter. Amen. Amen. And Jesus isn't done. He leans in some more. Verse 27, Jesus says, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was clean. Only Naaman the Syrian. This time Jesus takes his text from 2 Kings chapter 5. Again, from their sacred text, telling them that the people, that their, their ancestors, God's chosen people with leprosy, but instead of healing them, God healed an immigrant, an outsider in Israel, Naaman of Syria. In other words, Syrian immigrant lives matter. That's what Jesus was saying. All right. Jesus was leading a revolution, fighting all the temptations of the devil, refused to be seduced by the praise of people, but he preached to upset their status quo. He preached until his message and his mission was clear. This is our Jesus. Mm -hmm. We just saying, give me Jesus. This is our Jesus. He wanted his audience to know that they did not have a monopoly on God. But that God was God of the left out, the left behind, the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the immigrant. And in one short sermon, the people went from loving Jesus to hating Jesus. You do know there's a thin line between love and hate. And when they 
understand that Jesus means business, they not only hated them, but they tried to kill them. They tried to run them off the cliff. Now that was their response to Jesus. I want to know what is your response to Jesus. Now that the mission of this revolution is clear for whatever God has called you to do, your choices again, come on, help me out, I lead, follow, or get out of the way. And if by chance you decide to lead, or even follow, here are three things for you to take away. One, get to know Jesus of the Bible, that Jesus. Who is this Jesus of Luke 4? He's the same Jesus in Matthew 25 who said, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Stop thinking that our faith is simply a spiritual thing. Jesus is saying, I literally mean what I said. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those in prison, fight for justice, fight for equality, make a difference, change your part of the world. Number two, if you still decide to leave, my second point is check yourself. Where do you stand with the oppressed and the poor? Because God is on their side. Jesus just showed the congregation of that day that their sacred scripture clearly shows God's care and love and option for the other. The poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden, the other. And if you're looking down on anyone, God is not pleased. If you're looking down on anyone, God will raise them up. God will prepare a table before them. Ask God to deliver you from looking down on others if that's your thing or just make a decision to leave as part of this revolution. And if you still decide to leave, pick up the mantle and the example of those who have gone before us as we celebrate Black History Month. Lead like Jarena Lee who preached good news to the poor. Well before anyone told that woman that she could, she did. For the word was like fire shut up in her bones and she had to let it out. And finally things began to change. And don't stop there, but lead like Harriet Tubman who proclaimed freedom for the prisoners, freeing hundreds from chattel slavery. The slave system today looks like mass incarceration. So lead like Harriet Tubman and like Michelle Alexander. Study the problem. Stand against it. Decide to act. Until those, especially those incarcerated for minor offenses for substance abuse of a substance that's about to become legal. Or in jail simply because they don't have bail. Lead until they are set free, but don't stop there. Lead and strategize like Bayner Rustin, the key advisor of Dr. King and lead organizer of the March on Washington. Rustin, and, and he was in, he's also leading in LGBTQ and civil rights. He worked tirelessly for equal rights in this country. But don't stop there. Lead like Angela Davis to recover the sight of the blind. Do you work, live, or play with blind people? Blind to injustice, blind to injustice in the justice system, blind to the power of their vote so they don't vote, lead like Angela Davis and recover their sight and do it quickly and don't stop there but lead like Martin and Thurgood and Jackie Robinson and Carter G. Woodson who was right there from the University of Chicago, W.E.B. Du Bois, Duke Ellington. Frederick Douglass, Shirley Chisholm, Charles Drew, Jesse Jackson, even Michael Jackson. In other words, use whatever gifts God has given you and use it to make a difference, to bless the world, to change lives for the better, to bring love to the world. Be crystal clear that Christianity and the church is about righting the wrongs of society, lifting the oppressed, caring for the suffering, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And, and it's also about praising God, the God that is a God of deliverance, a God of restoration. 
a God of love. So when you lead or follow, when you do whatever God calls you to do, know that you are participating in an ongoing revolution. And it's a revolution. The good news is, and the reason we celebrate it's a revolution, we already know we're going to win. How do we keep going? It's tough sometimes, but when you know that God is on your side and that the victory is already won, that is our belief that we will celebrate in a few months when Jesus got up from the grave, we say that we win. They say a boxer doesn't have a problem fighting a fight that he already knows the outcome. We already know we're going to win, and so we fight this revolution together. Because it is the mission of our leader, Jesus. And he has called us to participate, to lead, 